Well, in our remaining time, we're, we're going to end with, with just a rip-roaring time of prayer together tonight. We need to pray. We need to pray. Anybody can pick up a big old rock and hurl it at a political candidate or party or system of government or culture. Anybody can pick up a stone and throw it. But people that have vision become stones that build living altars and they pray and they burn and they literally change nations through their faith-filled prayers. They see culture and they see this nation through eyes of faith and eyes of hope. Like the Father looks down at me and doesn't see all of my junk. He sees the Son of Righteousness in me and He calls that gold out of me and He calls me to come away from my junk and my sin and He says, Adam, that's not who you are. This is who you are. My Son in you righteousness is who you are and you guys we cannot afford to be people that finger point at the culture to remind them how wicked they are we've got to have the heart of the father that sees people as they are as prodigal sons and daughters to see the gold in them and to say you're better than that come up come up we're intercessors and this is an interceding church this is not a passive place this is not a place where we go, oh, well, the culture is going to hell in a handbasket. Let's just hold up here in the corner and have church till Jesus swings down and gets us out. No, we are powerful in the spirit to release the culture of heaven in our city and in our nation on earth as it is in heaven. And we are not shrinking back and we are not running from culture wars or culture fights. We just aren't using the weapons of this world to fight. Because our weapons are divine. They're powerful for the pulling down, demolishing of strongholds. And we are not up against flesh and blood. We are not up against a political candidate. We are up against strongholds and powers and principalities. And I just want you to take aim right now in the spirit. Say, I see you and Satan, your kingdom must come down. Woo! Your kingdom must come down. We wrestle not with flesh and blood. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Give us a vision for what fight we're in here and how to fight effectively. It was 2 a.m. this morning. Lindsay and I, we lived down on 81st Street at the north end of Virginia Beach by the ocean there. It's really a great, peaceful, calm place to live. The stretch of Atlantic Avenue that we live on is right at the end of the residential area where it turns and goes and becomes Shore Drive. And then it's all just woods and, and military base and, and state park. And it's an area where people late at night love to put the pedal to the metal and, 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 and drag race. So it's, it's not uncommon that I'll wake up at 3 in the morning just going, what was that? And last night was one of those nights. Lindsay and I are, are dead asleep. It's about 2 a.m. And we both just shoot up in our bed at this long screech followed by the sound of crunching metal, followed by, you know that, that quiet that's so quiet, it's loud? Like you can hear the quietness? There was no car alarm going off, there was no yelling, it was just dead quiet. And we both just felt a chill rush over us. And I picked up my phone next to my bed and I called 911 and I said, there's been some kind of horrible accident here um, please send somebody. And we got our clothes on and, and it, it's one of those things where, you know, car accidents happen every day and tragedies happen every day. But when you begin to walk up on a scene, it just, the reality just hits you. Life is precious. Life is short. And, and we literally were just thinking of somebody just there dead in their car, just alone in the silence. And it was just gripping us to where we couldn't stay in bed. We had to get our sweatpants on and, and we walked out there 2.15 in the morning on Atlantic Avenue. And by the time we turned the corner, man, you police officers, praise God for you. You emergency medical workers, praise God for what you do. By the time I rounded my street, there was already six police cars there and there was a fire truck pulling up on the scene. And the road was just strewn with bumpers and metal and a huge traffic sign just bent and in the middle of the road. It was just, it looked like a tornado had come through our street. And we walked, we walked up on it and I was like, this is, this can't be, this can't be good. 
And you know what? And we just started praying. Lord, we just release your angels. Lord, send your, send your healing, send your comfort. Just praying simple prayers. You know, not one person was seriously injured. Not one person. But, you know, walking up on that scene, we both felt that fear clutching us on the inside. And, and walking back to our house, thinking about our children that are going to be getting their, their learner's permits and driver's license in a few years. And just like the weight of the world, just boom. We just both just felt it come square on our shoulders. And walking home, and we just started praying for our kids. We started praying into the future. We started releasing angels 5, 10, 15 years from now over our children and over their families and over their vehicles and just saying, God, we, we are dependent on you. We need you. Lord, have mercy on our family. Have mercy on our children. And I just felt in my spirit, I just heard the Lord just drop this. And this is what I want to talk about tonight. He said, Adam, trust your sovereign. I am your sovereign. We don't live in a kingdom. We're not used to that kind of talk. Our leader, our president, I mean, we can take shots at him. We can make horrible posts about him. We can, we can rail him all day long if we want to. The idea that we have a sovereign who's the king of kings, the Lord of lords. And he just said that, Adam, trust your sovereign. And it got me thinking, what, what's a sovereign? You know, I love historical films, you know, where they talk about their king or their queen as their sovereign, you know, and, and, but I don't really have a grid in my everyday life for that. A sovereign is a monarch or a king or a queen who has supreme power and supreme authority. They are preeminent. It is indisputable. They are the greatest in degree. They are above all others in character, importance, and excellence. They are sovereign. Jesus is not our elected official. You may get to vote Jesus in or out of your heart, but you don't get to vote him in or out of king of the universe, creator of all things. He is king whether you like it or not. He is our sovereign. In the book of Acts, Jesus had ascended. The Holy Spirit had fallen in Acts chapter 2. The church was exploding. And the religious system of the day was trying to figure out how to deal with this exploding sect of followers of the way or Christians as they began to call them. And they were really, really worried because guys like Peter and John were turning the world upside down by praying simple prayers of faith in Jesus' name, and dead people are rising, and eyes are opening, and, 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 and people, there's, a, there's an, a momentum that's being created, and so, so John and Peter are called before the Sanhedrin, the religious council, and the elders of the, of the city, and, and, and they're almost done away with, and they, and they don't, and they spare them, and they give them a very firm warning, and they say, do not preach this message of this gospel about Jesus anymore. Don't do it. There's going to be severe consequences. And they release them. So Acts chapter 4, verse 23, Peter and John have just been released from the Sanhedrin. And it says, when they were released, they went to their friends and they reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they all lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord. Sovereign Lord. Lord of all things. King above kings and Sanhedrin. Sovereign Lord. Who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why? Did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against His anointed. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. Shake us, Lord. Shake this place that we're gathered in tonight. 
Shake us, Lord. Shake what can be shaken. Fear and insecurity and man-pleasing out of our lives. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And listen to this. They continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Elements of our culture and spirits at work that are trying to get you to shut up about the good news. Because it's not politically correct or it doesn't align with the values of the culture. But these guys, their lives under threat, gave thanks to the sovereign Lord and began, and they were filled with boldness. I believe God wants to fill us with a spirit of boldness. It's not an arrogant spirit. It's not a haughty spirit. It's not a I'm better than you spirit. It's boldness like a lion. Because we know who our sovereign. We know who our sovereign is. And he's king of the kings of this world and lord of the lords of this age. Amen? Amen. Peter and John had just experienced persecution for their faith. But as they prayed and declared the sovereignty of God and they declared Jesus as their sovereign, they only became bolder. Fear was fleeing seven ways. Some of you, fear is ganging up on you. Anxiety, worry, what are people going to think? God wants to put boldness in you that causes fear to flee away from your life. I want to say that I believe that Jesus is sovereign over America and that he is sovereign over the elections of nations. And he is sovereign over nations. He is sovereign over nations. Whether they declare him so doesn't make a hill of beans. He is sovereign. He is king of all kingdoms. Lord of all lorddoms. Did you know that the kings of the earth are in his hands? Do you believe Jesus is the king of kings and lord of lords? Did you know that he does not even need a Christian in high ranking office to bring about his will? He doesn't require anyone to bring about his will. But yet he uses kings and he uses kingdoms. But he does not require them. He certainly doesn't require me. It was a huge load off years ago as a young minister trying to prove that I was anointed and with something to say. And and the Lord just said, knock, knock. (laughs) Newsflash, buddy. I don't need you at all. Feel free to sit down and don't stand up again until you realize that I don't need you, your gift, your beautiful voice, your songs, your witty poetry, your roaring, your bohemian nature. I don't need any of it. I don't need it. But because you're my son, I call you into partnership with me because a father teaches his son how to do what the Father does. And I was so, what a, what a relief it was for me. What a weight off to go, okay, I don't have to perform anymore. Yeah. I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not anointed enough. I'm not prophetic enough. I'm not whatever enough. But I just love my dad. And he fills me with his love. And I get to just stand here and share it with you and then see you filled up and lead others and share it with others. It is the crazy, exponentially expanding kingdom that cannot, will not, shall not be stopped. And it is spreading all over the world and all over this city, even right now. He doesn't need a Christian in high-ranking office to bring about his will. Listen to this. Cyrus the Great was king over all Persia during the Babylonian captivity. He did not know God. He did not know the ways of God. And yet God chose him and prompted him to issue a decree that the temple in Jerusalem should be rebuilt and that the Jewish people should re-inhabit the land. Cyrus was not your Sunday school teacher. He was not even a good dude. And yet God sovereignly chose him and prompted him. Let's read Isaiah 45. This is really interesting. This is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus. 
not only like guys like Benny Hinn were anointed or Bill Johnson or Cyrus. <laughs> he didn't even go to church. He didn't even go to temple. <laughs> he hasn't been bar mitzvahed. This is what the sovereign Lord says to his anointed. And then he names Cyrus, his anointed. Can I just tell you that the gifts and callings of God are without repentance on all humanity, on all mankind, on every man and woman. He gives his gifts. And if he wants to call out the ugliest of them, anoint them and use them for his purposes, he'll do it just despite the religious spirit, because it's good fun. <laughs> he says to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of to subdue nations before him, to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. I will go before you and will level the mountains. I will break down gates of bronze and I will cut through bars of iron. I will give you hidden treasures, riches stored in secret places. Say amen. Just take that for yourself. So that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who summons you by name. For the sake of of Jacob, my servant, of Israel, my chosen, I summon you by name, and I bestow on you a title of honor, though you do not acknowledge me or know me. We're always looking for the most deserving in our leaders. We're looking for even the most Christ-like. That's not a bad thing. I just want to tell you Sometimes the Lord's plan and His understanding of goodness and His sovereignty is going to be beyond your understanding. His ways are not always our ways. Amen? Amen. They're higher. They're actually higher in their degree of understanding of redemption. We're not God. He is. Sometimes it's frustrating. Sometimes it's humbling. But that's just the way that it is. He says, I am the Lord. There is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you, Cyrus, though you have not acknowledged me or known me, so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, people may know that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form the light. I create darkness. I bring prosperity, create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. I will raise up Cyrus in his righteousness. I will raise up Cyrus in my righteousness. I will make all his ways straight. He will rebuild my city and set my exiles free. But not for a price or reward. No bribe, says the Lord Almighty. Friends, the sovereign Lord can use Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton or anybody else that he wants to to bring about his will. To work and to move for his plans and purposes for America. And I believe that he has plans and purposes for America. And part of the great wisdom of the prayer that we sang tonight, let heaven come, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus knelt in the garden and he prayed, Father, take this cup from me. This cannot be your good and perfect plan for these wicked people to crucify me. What good is in that? Father, take this cup from me, but nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And through the crushing of Jesus Christ and His resurrection, you and I stand here today justified and empowered and filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter didn't think it was a good idea. Never, Lord! That'll never happen to you. You can't be crucified. And what did Jesus say to him? Get behind me. What did he call Who did he call him? Satan. Why? Because you have in mind the things of man and not the things of God. I don't know the total mind of God. 
in the United States of America right now or in this election or in these two candidates, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. I don't have the full measure of understanding. I know that I'm going to vote. I know who I'm going to vote for and my conscience feels clear about it. But above that, I feel called and committed to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And come Tuesday night or Wednesday morning, whoever is the last man or woman standing, I'm putting a smile on my face and I'm going back into the place of intimacy with my God and I'm going to continue to call down heaven to earth. And that's what all of us should be doing. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. You may be despairing of your decision this Tuesday. You might be saying, I don't see the character of my Lord Jesus in either of these candidates. I remind you, Cyrus was an idol-worshiping pagan. It didn't matter. God in his sovereignty chose him for his purpose. And as God's people on this earth, we have the role of intercessors. Our prayers are powerful when yoked to the mercy of God. And I believe that that is the quality that God is looking for us and His church right now. A heart of mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. I can feel the criticalness and the judgment rising up within me. I spew it at my TV screen. <laughs> and then the Lord says, Adam, I desire mercy. I just, you don't have the full picture. Yoke yourself to mercy. Yoke yourself to prayer. Get a vision that's beyond your own understanding. Let me be sovereign. Let me work out my plan and let me use you and move through you and your prayers and your faith. Because honestly, we don't need the wisdom of men in this nation right now. We don't need another good idea. We need the sovereign move of heaven blowing like a fresh wind over hard hearts. We need a steady rain of heaven falling on hard, dry, cracked ground, softening hearts. And it's not, it's, it's not going to, it's going to come here. It's going to come here. It's going to speak to the heart before it speaks to the mind. Because heaven loves to offend the mind to get to the heart. So I'm offended. You're offended. We're all offended. Millennials are the most offended generation probably on the face of the earth and the most entitled. And man, I just bless you, millennials. I, I'm probably lumping myself in with you, but man, I just bless you guys to get the heart of heaven and to not even get so uppity with your own political convictions that you feel like you've got it figured out. And be careful before you go throwing stones at the last generation and the things that they honored and that were important to them because your kids will do it to you one day. What you sow, you will reap. If you sow dishonor now toward the previous generation, you will reap dishonor from your own children. Sorry, Dad, for everything that I ever said about you. You're amazing. And I love you, and I want to be just like you when I grow up. <laughs> so I want to close tonight with, with, with some prayer. And um, Alex, if you'd come up. And I, I've asked a few people to, to, to pray with me. And there are some areas that I think are in, that were really on my heart for our nation to pray. There were five different areas. And one of them that I want to pray for, I want us to pray about the abortion issue in our country. I'll get to you, June. I want us to pray about, about this issue of abortion because, you know, with, with King Manasseh in the Old Testament of Israel, what he did with children and sacrifice was so grievous to God that even when Josiah came along and restored the book of the law and the worship, the blood that had been spilled was so grievous, God said, I, I, there's still judgment coming. And I know that we're living on the other side of a covenant now. We're living in a new covenant and Jesus' blood has covered all sins, but we've been shedding innocent blood and we've been doing it for a while. And th there, there'll be a reaping of what's been sown and I believe God's heart is for mercy. And I know that this is an issue that we can get so angry about, but getting angry at people isn't gonna change anything. Getting angry at confused women who have abortions isn't going to solve anything. It's about mercy. 
And it's about people's hearts getting a revelation where when he says, from before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. It's awful what happens to these unborn children. I just want to remind you that they're with Jesus. He knew them before he began to knit their frames together. He knew you before he began to knit your frame together. He said, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. Well, we need to pray that people's hearts get humanized, if you will. Again, to go, this is not a political issue. This is not a rights issue. Mercy. Lord, have mercy that there'd be a turning of the heart, that it would be unpoliticized and it would be humanized. And that the whole nation would begin to cry out for mercy. And that Roe v. Wade would be overturned, not in a roar of anger, but in a unanimous cry for mercy. And only God can bring that revelation to the heart. Man speaking to the mind of man can't bring that change, but God can bring it to the heart. He can show us the poverty of our own heart. And we can cry out for mercy. So we're going to pray over that area. We're going to pray over racial division in this nation because it's deep and it's, the wounds are still festering and they're manifesting all over the place. And it's not enough to say, well, it wasn't my generation. It's not my responsibility. God wants to yoke our heart in, in, to that place where we, we have understanding of people's hurt and pain and what was done for generations and so that we can come alongside in a place of mercy and we, we can begin to see a healing take place that is supernatural. We need, you know, we talk about God wanting to heal cancer and heal sicknesses. This is that kind of an issue. It is a disease and infirmity of the heart and it needs a deep healing touch from Holy Spirit. And so we're going to pray for that tonight as well. We're going to pray over our nation and we're going to, we're going to pray about the sexual immorality that is all over our nation and, and the perversion that has crept in in, in the backwards thinking. And we're going to ask again, we're not going to point fingers or throw stones, but we're going to cry out for mercy. I've, had, I've been having the opportunity recently to work with so many new believers and, and, and they don't, they're like, really? I can't, I, I want to go away with my girlfriend and we want to have a nice weekend together and you're telling me, we shouldn't have sex together. And, and, and what I'm realizing is that, wow, we've just, we've lost the beauty of what God created and what he meant for it to be in covenant. And I've been so excited to see actually these people who've lived lives of, of casual sex and immorality, and it's left them bankrupt and void. And they're actually getting excited and they're going, you mean there's, there's something deeper and better for this? It doesn't just have to be this carnal, lusty thing. It's actually, it's actually a beautiful thing. They're actually getting excited. I believe that there's a generation coming that is going to get excited and a vision for purity because they're going to see the wisdom of heaven in it. And we're going to cry out and contend for God for that. We're going to pray mercy for pride and arrogance. This pride and arrogance. We're the most powerful, wealthiest nation in the world. And there's a sense of entitlement. And there's this pride. And then between the generations, there's pride and there's arrogance. And we're going to ask God to tear those walls down and to actually bring an intergenerational coming together, honoring of fathers. As it says in Malachi, I'll turn the hearts of the children to the fathers and the hearts of the fathers to the children. And then finally, we're going to pray for revival. So would you just stand with me right now? And I want to invite.